For something completely different, I'm going to show you an eccentric camera made in England around 1922 called the Ensign Cupid. It's actually quite an innovative camera for its time, as I'll explain in the video. Ironically, given its name, it's a camera I've rather fallen in love with, even though it's hardly love at first sight. Some time ago, I was looking at photos of old cameras online, trying to find the most beautiful looking cameras for a video I was making. One of the cameras that caught my eye was this blue-coloured box camera with lovely chrome features, the Duo Ensign 2.25B, made by the Houghton Butcher Company in England in around 1930. At the same time, I saw another, earlier Ensign camera that I thought was rather ugly. It had a strange angular body and, to me, a ridiculous large viewfinder. The viewfinder seemed better suited to an artillery range or perhaps a bow and arrow, the camera also had a rather silly name, the Cupid, perhaps named after its viewfinder. When I posted my YouTube video on beautiful cameras, I included both cameras, but I wasn't very complimentary about the Cupid. How could the same company make such a lovely camera on one hand and such an ugly one on the other? Since then, I've changed my mind, as I've become more and more fascinated and enamoured with the camera, especially the shape of its body. I spent a lot of time looking at it online, reading about it, and I've gone from ridiculing the camera to owning not one, but two copies. So why the change? What's become so attractive about the Cupid? Let's start with its size. One of the fun things about buying vintage cameras online, without having the opportunity to hold the cameras beforehand, or see them being held, is that you can be surprised by their size. Take, for example, the Vest Pocket Kodak. You know it's small from the name, but how small is it in reality? Well, it's pretty small. But then there's the Kodak 3A, made around 1910. It was called a folding pocket Kodak. You might think it's reasonably small and pocketable, but it's actually big. I don't know what kinds of pockets people had in the early 1900s, but they must have been really big and deep. And then another Ensign box camera to go alongside the Dewar Ensign. It's a falling plate camera from around 1916, sold as a portable camera, i.e. not just for studios or in the field with tripods. Well, this is much larger than I expected. So how large is the Cupid? I really didn't know at first. I thought it might be quite large, given its extravagant-looking viewfinders. It doesn't look like a petite camera. Plus, there's that handle on the side. This handle was one of the features that intrigued me. It's rather odd, sort of tacked on the side, and only one side. The handle has the same shape as a Georgian, i.e. in an 18th century handle on English furniture. Those handles can be quite large. To end any suspense, here is the Cupid in the flesh. As you can see now, it's small, even compared to the Vest Pocket Kodak. It feels good in the hands. And the oversized viewfinder makes more sense. In fact, it's a very good arrangement for lining up your shots. Better than those glass and mirror viewfinders that are typically positioned down the side of other cameras of this age. And the viewfinders conveniently fold down on top of the camera, so the camera really is pocket-sized. Most interesting to me, it actually feels like I'm holding a small, modern digital camera. There's the same body shape, with a top where you could imagine placing the modern dials and shutter button. The back is flat like a digital camera and could accommodate an electronic screen. And the front, while it clearly doesn't have a modern-style fixed lens or interchangeable lens, it does place the lens in the same position, and it's a similar size as it protrudes from the body. This was, in fact, a very innovative and unique body design for the early 1920s. And to understand why, you need to consider what other cameras looked like at the time, and their shapes and sizes. To help do this, I just happened to have an original Ensign Handbook of Photography from 1922, the year the Cupid was first introduced. Ensign was the brand name used by the Houghton Butcher Manufacturing Company in the UK, who made a wide range of cameras and accessories, or sundras as they call them. They competed directly with Kodak, who were very active in the UK. This little book starts off with an essay on the simplicity of photography and how easy it is to make good pictures. It wasn't easy at all compared to our digital world, but still, they were trying to promote photography to a wider audience. And I like the advertisement on the back as well, talking about holidays. You have to remember that in the 1920s, ordinary people were travelling on holidays more than they used to, and taking pictures was becoming quite a fad. The handbook has over 85 pages of details on Ensign cameras and different lens options, including both dry plate and roll film cameras. You can broadly divide the cameras on sale into the following types, and I'll show you a few examples from the handbook. There were box cameras of various types and sizes. 
Folding bellows cameras, both large, such as this one, and small, like these pocket-sized collapsible cameras. Reflex cameras, where you look down through a single lens using a mirror inside the camera. Focal plane cameras, designed for press photographers who needed a camera that could be opened up very quickly. And field cameras, which are essentially very large bellows cameras. There was no mention of or category for the Cupid. The Cupid was only just about to be launched, so it wasn't included in the 1922 handbook. The main point is that there was no camera on the market, at least not one I've seen, that looked remotely like the Cupid, a small and easy to use point and shoot camera with a fixed lens. It wasn't until over 10 years later, around 1934, that Kodak made a small portable point and shoot camera with a body made out of Bakelite, the Baby Brownie. Or even later, in 1937, when Palmer introduced this sleek looking camera, also with a Bakelite body. Of course, the Cupid wasn't the most revolutionary camera introduced around this time. That accolade must definitely go to the Leicas from Germany. Including the early Leica prototype camera dating back to 1914, then the Leica Zero produced in the early 1920s, and by 1930, the Leica One with interchangeable lenses. The Leicas were much, much more important cameras in terms of the impact of their designs and their legacy. The Cupid still deserves to be remembered for its unique and innovative body, and I'll briefly go through the different versions of the camera and then explain how it works if you're interested in the details. In terms of the different versions, there are some cosmetic changes to the camera during its years of production after 1922. The body itself was made in either smooth metal or what's known as crackled black or it was painted blue. My version on the left is an early version where the text on the front left is embossed into the body and there's only one patent mentioned. In fact, this is the earliest version because the patent is only provisional. The camera on the right is a later version and you can see it has a bolted on nameplate with two patents. The camera also has a rougher crackled black metal finish. I think the top button on my later camera has been replaced at some point. But anyway, this was the first Cupid I acquired. And when I saw the earlier Cupid for sale, I was smitten and I had to have it. You could also buy a clip-on viewfinder to go on the side if you felt you needed one. But quite frankly, I don't see the point with that large viewfinder on top. All the versions had a 70mm meniscus lens with an aperture of around f6, but in practice it stopped down to a working aperture of around f14. The shutter mechanism consisted of a guillotine of two vertically sliding plates working in front of the lens and spring powered. The camera takes two and a quarter by one and a half inch roll film. You open up the camera and load the film using the spools in the camera and on the roll film. Once the film is loaded, it's a very simple camera to operate. You have the option of either taking an instantaneous shot with the shutter opening and closing when you push the shutter button, or you can set the shutter mechanism to time and the shutter button opens the shutter and it stays open until you stop pressing the button. So you can time the duration of your exposure. You need to pull this rod up for setting the shutter up and ready. Line up the composition using the viewfinder, and then you press the shutter button here on the side. The Cupid provided an interesting solution that allowed you to take two separate shots on each part of the film roll, where with other cameras you could only take one shot. This was achieved by carefully winding the film on to a position you could see through the two ruby windows on the back. Using this approach, the cameras could take 16 pictures on an eight exposure spool, or as it says on this early model, 12 pictures on a 6 exposure spool. The excellent website artdecocameras.com has a few photos taken with the camera and they look pretty good to me. You can check them out yourself. So that's the Ensign Cupid and an explanation of why I love this really rather unusual camera and its body. I feel guilty I was so disparaging about the camera when I first saw it online and in a way this video is my attempt to right that wrong. I hope you enjoyed this video and until the next time, all the best.